Welcome friends to the second day of our three-day event in New Jersey. Very happy to welcome you again and to again share with you some of my experiences with the great master whose picture you see here, Azur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh Ji. He transformed my life and he transformed the lives of thousands of others. So he was the greatest master that I come across. What are the signs of a master? The great master said, it appears the number of masters is growing very large. And maybe even in his time, the number of masters had exceeded the number of disciples. But very few are perfect living masters. Very few at any time. And the reason for that is, there are very few seekers seeking the ultimate truth. So that is why he said the number of perfect living masters, even in this iron age, Kali Yuga, can be counted on the fingers of the two hands. As you know, a limit of almost eight. That's a very small number. And he pointed out how rare it is for a perfect living master to appear in our life. But if we are seekers, we will find one. There was a disciple of his. Earlier I have told his story, but I can share with you again. By the way, many of you are telling me I repeat the same things. That's a sign of old age. <laughs> At my age, that is natural. There was a disciple of his named Tirlok Chand. Tirlok Chand was a buildings and roads engineer like great master was. He worked in the country called Burma at that time, Myanmar. And he was very, very miserly in spending money. He would look at a one rupee note and say to spend or not to spend. And then he would say not to spend in his pocket. That was normal. With this method, even with a small salary, he was able to accumulate 30,000 rupees in savings account. When he found out that he could not find a master who could take him to his ultimate destination, he searched all over. He learned that there was a master in India, in a city called Madras at that time, now called Chennai, that in Madras city there was a Swami who said that he could take you to the highest level of enlightenment. He sold everything in Burma and came over to Madras to meet the Swami. When he came to Swami, Swamiji said, Have you heard the story of King Janak? And he had heard the story of King Janak. He said, Yes, I have. For some of you who may not have heard the story, it's a little bit of the story of King Janak. King Janak was a king in India who was also a great seeker seeker of the ultimate truth. He asked his ministers and his secretaries that he wants to find the ultimate knowledge, the real knowledge. And he wanted instant knowledge. When I hear this story that he wanted instant knowledge, I often think he might have been an American in a past life. <laughs> they want everything instant. Instant coffee, for example. So he wanted instant knowledge. And he asked his secretaries and cabinet ministers and they all advised him, King Janak, you are living in a great country, full of mystics, full of swamis, full of enlightened people. You just have to call for them. Arrange a big holy festival in Yagya. And in that feast, they will all come. Especially if the food is good. And there's plenty of rice pudding. They like rice pudding. I don't know why, but they do. And he arranged a big festival like that and called for a lot of these yogis, swamis and other enlightened people they could send messages to. And he held a one-day festival in his palace. He disguised, the king disguised himself like an ordinary tourist so he could move amongst them and get true knowledge. When he moved around with them, he was very disappointed because they were all arguing with each other, 
almost angry with each other. Each knew better than the other. They were interpreting the same scriptures in different ways and arguing who is right and who is wrong. And he found their anger was so much. Some would even come to blows over their difference of opinion. So he said, there is no true knowledge here. There might be learning. They might have remembered all the scriptures. They might have read so much. And they are just talking about what they have learned by heart. But they have no true knowledge. So he was very disappointed. And he came back to the palace. And he told his secretaries and minister that this is very disappointing. I didn't want this kind of knowledge. I want true knowledge. They said, King, you have arranged a very one day affair. This country is big. You should have a seven day affair. So he held a bigger, larger conference. And seven days, and a big number of tents were put up on his palace grounds. And so many more sadhus and swamis and yogis and enlightened people came. And he again disguised himself and every day he would go around and see what they were teaching. And he was once again very disappointed. It was just a sevenfold experience of the first day. So he again was very disappointed and told his secretaries and ministers, these people don't have knowledge, they have learning. They remember words, but there is no knowledge here. They are just discussing intellectual words that they have learned from books. I don't want this kind of learning. I want knowledge, real knowledge. Then the minister said, King, you will not get this kind of knowledge from these people. The man who has this knowledge is not coming to these festivals. And he said, is there such a man? He says, yes, there is one. He has a small hut on the bank of the river. And his name is Ashta Bakar. Ashta Bakar means eight beds. He was little def deformed in his body and humped at the back with eight humps on the back. So that is why they named him Ashta Bakar. And the king said, you should have told me earlier. So he went to Ashta Bakar, to his hut. And Ashta Bakar was surprised the king has come. He said, what can I do for you? He said, I have not come as the king. I have come as a beggar. I have come to get ultimate true knowledge. Will you come to my palace and give me true knowledge? Ashta Bakar said, since you have taken the trouble to come to me, I will certainly come and give you true knowledge. So, day was fixed when Ashta Bakar visited the palace and the king invited all his courtiers, all nobility, even neighboring kings and queens and princes all of them came and the auditorium and the palace was filled up with royalty and nobility. As Ashtabhakar entered along with five or six or seven of his disciples, they took off their shoes at the door to the entrance, which was customary, there, customary for these people to take off their shoes before entering a place of knowledge. When he came up, the king had placed two chairs on the, the stage on the dais. And he had one chair for himself and one for the master. So they sat down. And as they were walking, the people saw that this man was a deformed person. And what kind of knowledge can he give us? So there was a murmuring going on in the audience. That this fellow, look at his body. He is a deformed person coming to give us some knowledge. So the king also heard and they... Ashtabhakar also heard these people are murmuring. So when the master sat on the chair, he said, King, what is the price of leather today? The king said, Master, I invited you to give us true knowledge. What has the price of leather to do with it? And Ashtabhakar said, Are these not all leather merchants sitting here? He said, No, they are royalty and nobility. He said, but the way they were looking at my skin, I thought maybe they deal in leather. <laughs> so the, everybody understood he has a sense of humor. So they all kept quiet after that. Then Ashtabhakar said, King, what kind of knowledge do you want? King said, I want real knowledge, instant knowledge. Ashtabhakar said, even an instant has some time. How much is an instant? He said, an instant is... When I go out horse riding, 
from the time I put my foot in the stirrup and jump on the saddle, that's an instant. He said, that kind of knowledge, you have to pay a price. And the king said, I am willing to pay any price. My entire tragedy and coffer is open to you. You name your price and I'll pay you. The Ashtabhakta said, I want three things. King said, you can have 10, 20, whatever you want. He said, no, I want only three things as a price for ultimate knowledge. First, give me your body. Second, give me your wealth. Third, give me your mind. If you can give me these three, I will give you ultimate knowledge. It was a very strange price tag, but the king was really a great seeker. Therefore, he readily agreed. He says, Master, my body is yours. My, all my wealth is yours. And my mind is yours. Ashtabhakar said, are you sure you have given these to me? He said, yes, Master. He said, all right, let's start with the body. Your body is mine. I can place it wherever I like. Please get up from this chair and walk up to my shoes I left at the door and sit on my shoes. It was a very strange order. But the king said, I have given the body to the master. I have to obey him. So he got up and walked towards the door. As he was walking, again they was being murmuring, what kind of education is this? We were invited to hear this silly story of a king going and sitting on shoes. What kind of knowledge is this? They were all talking like this. The king said, these people don't know what I am looking for. They think I am such a wealthy king, have so much wealth, and they are, and I am now going to sit on shoes. That's what they are thinking. When this thought came to him, Ashtabhaka shouted from the stage, King, you have no business to think of the wealth you already given it to me. So, my God, I forgot I had given the wealth to this man. What am I thinking? He's Ashtabhakar again shouted, You can't even think what you gave or not gave, you gave on your mind to me. And the king held up his hands on his head, I can't even think now. And at that moment, he got enlightened. And Ashtabhakar said, You need not go to the shoes, come back. So he came back, he said, sit down, tell me, did you get true knowledge? He said, yes, I did. Did it take any time? He said, it was less than an instant. He said, any questions? He said, no. The knowledge was complete in an instant. He said, now look, this was a sample. Now I'll tell you how to meditate. And if you meditate regularly, after 20 years, you will get the same knowledge again. Because meditation is a very slow process. You came at a very special time. And I wanted to show you that the whole knowledge is lying inside you. If you can surrender these three things, you can surrender your body, surrender your wealth, surrender your mind, you get instant knowledge. I don't need your mind. I don't. I am having a problem with my own, Mr. said. I don't need your wealth. I'm happy where I am. And certainly I don't need your body. I have my own karma and I am living according to that. So take these back. But from today, think they belong to Ashtabhakar. If you can even have this thought that this body I am using belongs to Ashtabhakar, I should not do anything which will displease him. This wealth belongs to him. I must use wisely. It belongs to the master. I must think rightly in my mind because the mind belongs to the master. You still benefit and get the true knowledge. So this was the story of King Janak and Ashtabhaka. So the Swamiji told in Madras city to the Lokchan, have you heard this story? He said, yes, master, I have. He said, I work on the same principle. I also work on the same principle. Give me your body, give me your mind, give me your wealth and I'll give you true knowledge. And the Lokchan was so keen to get true knowledge that he said, Master, all three of these are yours. I'll follow the example of King Janak. He said, let's start with wealth first. How much do you have? He said, I have saved 30,000 rupees over my whole career in this service. He said, transfer that to my account. I have to start building a temple. Now imagine a man who was worried about one rupee being transferred, transferred the whole 30,000 rupees 
to the account of the master. He said, now comes the turn of the body. Body being mine, you have to make a sacrifice. Like I made a sacrifice, the Swami said, to my master. The sacrifice was that in order to do the meditation according to my instructions, the special way of doing pranayam, breathing exercise, in which you must take one breath from one nostril and second breath from second nostril alternately. And to do that, you cannot use your fingers because fingers are outside and truth lies inside. Therefore, you have to do it internally by twisting your tongue back. And since the tongue is attached to the tendons, you have to get it cut. And he said, see, I got mine cut from my master. And he took his tongue out like a snake's tongue. And he said, I turn it around. And from internally, I breathe with one nostril on one side and the other alternately. It was a terrible torture. And he said, I will not make an easy surgery. I'll rub it, not only with sandpaper, I will use some very strong nettle rash, some, that, 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 some it's called bichu in India, it's like a scorpion. It cuts you like a scorpion. So I'll rub it with that for you to suffer pain. Pain is necessary to get something so valuable. And the Rokchand went through that pain and suffering and torture for more than a month to get that detached. And then he was able to do the same thing his master was doing. He said, now comes the time of your mind. The mind must repeat certain mantras, I will tell you. And the mantra will be different for one nostril and different for the other. So he taught him some way of meditation with the breathing exercises. Have we gone through all the torture? He had some experiences of calmness of mind. He saw some lights and colors. And he told the master after some time, I have practiced this meditation. This was not what I was looking for. I did not want just to see some lights and colors. I wanted to get ultimate knowledge, real knowledge, like Ashtabhakar gave to King Janak. And I haven't got that. And the Swamiji said, that's all I can give you. If you want more, you have to find somebody else. Much later, this the Lokchan found great master. Baba Saul Singh. And he came to him and got initiated and made very rapid progress in his, in his meditation. And he was, became like a family friend in our family. So we used to spend a lot of time together and used to share these stories of his own experiences. One day we were sitting with Great Master in a very small group in the evening and the Lokchang was there. I and my dad were also there with the Master. And he said to Great Master, Master, had I known that this true knowledge I have to get from you, I would not have given those 30,000 rupees to that Swami. <laughs> They're still, you know, still in his mind. <laughs> and great master laughed. And he said, the Rokchand you don't know, the day you came to me, I transferred those 30,000 to my account. And he said, this is not something physical. That what time you spent with the Swami there, has counted towards your meditation even here. That we never lose anything that we do in our seeking of the truth. Many masters can come in our life and each one takes us to a step forward till we are ready for a perfect living master. So this was a great story and we were affected by it because there were so many people who used to say, do we have the proper master? Do we have a perfect master? This is not a necessary question at all. Masters appear in our life who we need, who we need at that time. And they take us a step forward where we are needing to go. It's only when our progress is not enough, when we feel we have not got enough from a particular master and we are at a stalemate, the next master can come to your life. The masters all have their own knowledge up to certain limits. And as it happens, these experiences of inner levels of consciousness, inner levels of different worlds that have been created, these experiences are so binding. Each looks like it's final. It does not look there's something more. When people 
when masters go up to the astral stage and see the heavens and see how the physical world has been copied from there, they say, we've come to the ultimate. We have come to from where all the world is originating. So for them, there is no idea that there can be anything more. And those who go to the causal plane, they discover the universal mind and they say, this is the origin of everything. They do not distinguish between the mind and the soul. So soul masters are themselves convinced that they have reached the highest point. Many of them will call that as a true home. So that is why it's not easy for a person to know which is the true home unless you have experienced. When you get experience up to a certain point and you get stuck there and you feel you need more and you feel there is something more, then another master appears in your life. If you don't, then you have achieved your goal. Whatever goal somebody has, people have different goals. Most of the people who go to these swamis and masters, they are looking for some worldly intervention in their problems. They say, if we are sick, please help us. My child is sick, please help us. I didn't win the lottery. Can I win the next lottery? Please do some divine intervention. Most of the people are asking for something which is confined to the physical world. And they meet for swamis, psychics, others, who tell them some things and they make them feel good. So their goal is only to get some help in this physical world and they get it. There are others who want more than that. They say, no, we want to find out who we are, what our soul is, what is our Atma is. And then they go want to go within. When they are given an eternal experience, they feel out-of-body experiences. They feel very good. There are so many yogis and swamis who are teaching us that the whole area of experience lies in the six centers of the energy centers below the eyes and up the eyes. And maybe there's one that's at the top of the crown chakra at the top. They are confining themselves to the physical body and the different energy centers which is controlling this physical experience, which is controlling all physical experiences. There is a very big difference between energy centers and centers of awareness. And they are not aware of it. So that is why they think energy is everything. They say ultimately all vibration. It's all some kind of frequency. They are talking of physical energy. They are talking of physical terms and think it's the highest spirituality. You can't blame them because that's their experience. And their experience, when you get that, you feel that is it. There's nothing more. It's only those souls, those seekers, who say this is not what we want. We want more than that, that another master appears in their life. It is only those who say we want to go to our ultimate home. We want to go and merge where we belong to ultimately that they find a perfect living master. And that is why since the number of seekers of that kind is limited, the number of masters are also limited. And that is why there are very few masters of that type because there are very few seekers of that kind. But many seekers go to masters and they are expecting every master to be doing the same thing. All the masters don't do the same thing. They do what is our own in eternal goals as seekers. They provide what we seek. There is a philosophy called The Secret. There's a book published called The Secret, which says there's a law of attraction. And whatever you are seeking or thinking, you get that. And those people who wrote it, the book, the secret and we made a movie out of it. They said we sought to make million dollars, we made it. They did with writing the book and the book sold very well. And now other people are trying the same method, they don't make anything. So they wonder where the secret is missing in us. The secret is missing because they miss out some parts of the secret. One of the parts is, and I've read the book, one of the parts is that not only must you think what you want to get, you should believe that you already got it. And this is part of that. The law of attraction works. You have to have full faith and belief you got it. The mind doesn't do that. The mind says, yes, I have belief. I hope it will happen. Yeah. That's how the mind thinks. So that is why the truth is, if you are seeking anything, 
with conviction you will get it as a true whether it's physical or astral or causal or ultimate that is why i emphasize the importance of seeking the seeking is a secret seeking with conviction seeking with faith now what is faith faith has been defined very differently at different times so most of the people say this is my faith means this is my religion and in that it can be total blind faith we belong to religion how did we belong it because we were born with two parents who believed in that we grew up with that we are confined to that we think moving out of it will be some great sin will be committing so we are tied down to belief system which we have no experience it's all blind faith but we have to tie down because we are told by creating fear in us that if you don't follow hell will come to you now the religions are surviving mostly out of creating some kind of a panic or fear if you don't follow and go somewhere else you lose everything you go to hell this uh, this whole thing is going on with blind faith that's also called faith that's my faith so but actual faith is when you have no doubt to have a faith where you have no doubt is very rare because people even when they have access to religion they go there they have some doubts whether things are really happening and seekers who want more than merely accepting what is being told to them always have a doubt about what are they being taught if you don't have experience that is why great masters teaching was do not have any kind of blind faith at all blind faith is not spiritual it could be religion but not spiritual if you want to be advanced in spirituality you must be getting real faith through experience personal experience not somebody else's experience his religion is based upon somebody else's experience not your own where as spirituality requires that you have your own experience and believe as much as you experience not more than that if you don't have more experience don't deny that it doesn't exist because you don't have it it doesn't exist say i haven't had it when i have it i'll believe that also that is why this step by step growth of experience and faith faith based upon growth of experience against blind faith i would say one should have a living faith all living things grow and faith grows with experience if it is living faith as you have more experience the experience can be of two types an external experience and internal experience we sometimes emphasize one more than the other sometimes we say oh my life has changed since i met this master things are turning out i can no master's hand in everything but i don't have anything inside i don't see anything inside so maybe i can't believe anything remember that inside and outside are no different outside is being projected from inside and sometimes you get the experience outside sometimes you get the experience inside it depends on the personality of the person and whether you are introspective or or you are ex- out exposed to outside it all depends so therefore our individual personality creates those experiences there are also some other reasons sometimes we don't get internal experiences we get external experiences the most famous story of that is a true story of my own master's master baba saavan singh my master was initiated by another master named baba jamal singh and baba jamal singh was a disciple of another master we affectionately call him swami ji said shivdyal singh of agra and who is called swami ji swami shivdyal singh so it is the story of baba jamal singh that baba jamal singh was feeling that he missed his master in those days it was very difficult for poor people to travel long distances baba jamal singh lived in punjab province and agra was in the other province so it was a little long journey to go there but he wanted to go and meet his master but he wanted to make sure that he has his master's permission to come 
So Baba Jamal Singh wrote to his master. He said, Beloved master, I am missing you very much. I am feeling such a strong desire to be with you. Please permit me to come and see you. Mail used to take a long time in those days. After a month, a reply comes from Swamiji. My beloved son, Jamal Singh, very happy to receive your letter and to know that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions. Jamal Singh was surprised. My soul is going nowhere. And how is this written? This must be meant for somebody else. So he wrote a second letter. Beloved Swamiji, I received your letter, but you have said my soul is roaming around in Khand Brahman inside. I am not roaming anywhere. I am just outside. And I am just missing you so much that I just want to see you. After a month, another letter comes. My beloved son, Chamal Singh, very happy to receive your second letter. And I am further pleased to know that your soul is moving around in high regions. So far as coming to see me is concerned, come in the first week of next month. So, armed with these two letters, Jamal Singh reaches Agra and presents them to his master. Master, you wrote these two letters, they were not meant for me. My soul was not going anywhere. As you wrote this roaming around in our regions. And Swamiji said, Okay, let us go and meditate a little. There were 10 or 12 people sitting outside. And Baba Jamal Singh and Swamiji went inside the, the little hut they had. And in about half an hour they came out. Then Swamiji asks Jamal Singh, Now Jamal Singh tell me, Was your soul roaming around in the higher regions when I wrote that letter to you? Yes, Master. I am not asking if your soul was roaming around now during meditation. I am asking, do you recall that your soul was roaming around in the higher regions when I wrote the letters to you? Yes, Master. This was surprising for the ten people sitting outside. So they said, how could that be? So then Swamiji addressed those people. He said, a man cannot be missing somebody so much if nothing is happening inside. The fact he was missing so much. And he was feeling that love and pull of the master. Then he wanted to go and see him. And that's what he was expressing in his letter. This cannot happen unless there's an internal progress going on. But he was blinded from having experience of an internal experience because he was at work. And he had to complete the work which his karma obligated him to do on his job. And it was obligated on him to look after people that were around him. So masters often do that. When your physical karma requires you to take care of your family, your children, your job, if all the intention were in higher experiences inside, you would not be able to fulfill your karma, which can lead to your having to come for a later life. And very often, when the master do not want you to have another life, they do that and you feel that great progress somewhere inside, but you do not see. This is they put blinders deliberately. And this is a very classic example of how when we have big obligations to fulfill just part of our karmic uh, dharma, karmic obligation to, uh, to life, the masters can put blinders to go over this. But when the blinders are removed, you don't feel you're getting in something at that time. You remember that you got everything at that time. You remember everything. You recall that the experience were taking place at the very time when you were feeling like that. So this is a very interesting experience because many people say we feel very strong pull. We know miracles are happening outside in our life. But maybe we don't see anything inside. Maybe we are not making any progress. That is not true. So therefore you cannot really calculate the progress you make on a spiritual journey merely by looking at what spectacles you see inside. You can see a lot of spectacles inside, you can see a lot, have a lot of experiences. The faith that comes in, the faith, the unshakable faith that comes to us comes not only from watching something inside, but from both sides, internal and external experience. The mind creates doubt on every experience. 
Maybe it's not a spiritual experience. Maybe it's just a coincidence. Maybe it just happened by chance. But if it keeps on happening, ultimately, the mind has to be convinced. The mind gets convinced. No, this is not, this is not uh, anything to be doubting. So when you have that faith, complete, unshakable faith, whatever you see, you get it. Without faith. And the, and the secret is true at that time. They have revealed that in the book. But people forget that part, that you have to have full faith. Not only that what you are attracting will happen, you have to believe it has happened and will just be experiencing it. So that kind of faith will get you whatever you want. So it's very interesting how people are not judging their progress. Just in spite of the fact they see their life has changed. They see miracles happening. They say these things could not have happened. They feel that the law of probability is not working anymore, that improbable things are happening. These are all miracles, the miraculous happenings. And they are not happening because of something that is just coincidental. They are happening because of what is happening inside us. And inside and outside are the same. There is one saying by Guru Nanak. He says, Antar Bahar Eko Jana. Yehi Guru Gyan Bataya. That my Guru has taught me that do not distinguish between the outside and the inside. So make it very clear that these events that are happening in our life outside are merely a reflection of what is happening inside. So when you have these kind of experiences outside, that's a proof that you're making progress inside. And there's no reason to be disheartened. Of course, if your obligations outside are fulfilled, and there are a lot of more obligations today than they were ever, ever in the past, as we move more and more into the Iron Age, as we move into Kali Yuga, this current Yuga, there are more and more obligations placed upon us outside. The seekers are still there in the same state, along with the rest of the world and the rest of society who are facing all these bigger obligations. And and people are sometimes saying, I want to go on a spiritual path. Should I give up all my obligations? Of course not. If you give up your obligations, you stay back to help fulfill the obligation in another life. This is karma. This is law of karma operating in this physical world. The physical life is sustained by karma, as I explained yesterday. That is why it is necessary to fulfill your obligations. If you are married, you have to look after your spouse. You have, you have to have children, you have to look after children. You have to do your job, do it in the best way. According to Lord Krishna, in his uh, lectures, he would say, Yoga, Karma, Su Kaushalam. If you want to be a true yogi, if you want to attain enlightenment, do your action with the utmost skill. But do not expect any fruit of it. If you expect fruit, it's a local transaction, not spiritual. But if you are doing your action with the utmost skill that you have been given to do that, you become a yogi. In the Bhagavad Gita, the three forms of yoga are mentioned when Krishna is talking to Arjun in the battlefield. Imagine what kind of battle they had, that uh, the two armies are ready to fight, and the driver of the chariot, the chauffeur, Krishna, is telling the prince, Arjun, I want to tell you about the truth. The truth is, none of these exist. This is just a show going on. And he said, but these are real armies. I can see my own relatives fighting each other. And he said, they are already dead. But you have not reached that point in time to see they are dead. So he um, made a opened his mouth in a big way, according to the Gita, and showed that they were all dead. To show the truth that what has happened has already happened. It's not, not that it will happen. It's already happened. You haven't seen it yet. Time will take you to that point. And then he says, but you can get enlightened during this period when you are having even the battle. And what are the three ways? He says, first is the skillful execution of your duty, your karma or your dharma, and without expecting the fruit thereof. So that is, your mind will not 
we can be subdued if you don't expect fruits. But since we always say, I'm doing something good, I should get a reward. Since I'm doing something this, what am I going to get out of it? What is in it for me? It no longer becomes a yoga. But if you can do that, it's a yoga. Second, he says, is the Sankhya Yoga or Gyan Yoga. Distinct from Karam Yoga, the Yoga, Gyan Yoga is learn more knowledge, acquire more knowledge. So read all the books you can and find out the limit of knowledge. Then you find the mind cannot learn anything beyond that because what you are seeking is beyond time and space, beyond thoughts. You could automatically find that the mind has to be left behind. You could become a yogi. He says, but the highest form, highest form of yoga to practice is the yoga called bhakti yoga, the yoga of love and devotion. If you have love and devotion, that comes from beyond the mind anyway. So that is why it can pull you beyond the mind. So he describes these three methods of attaining the yogic state to be a yoga. The yogi means one who has union with the truth, ultimate truth. So these are great stories written for us so that we can understand that there are many ways to approach it. So we cannot always say that in a particular order, if I have those experiences, I am making progress or I am not making progress. You can be performing your spiritual actions in many ways in life and doing your duty as, as has been understood by you. Karma creates duties. They say there is karma and dharma. Dharma is how you should cope up with the karma. Karma is of three kinds. And it's important, the knowledge about karma is important because it is, it is constituting our life. If you don't have any karma, you can't be here. Some people ask me, is my karma over? I said, no, you are alive. <laughs> if you are alive, you still have karma. When karma is over, you die. Then you carry your karma to the next life. So karma is what is holding us in our physical bodies. And that is why we welcome. We welcome karma. American disciple of great master. His name was Julian Johnson. Dr. Julian Johnson. And he wrote books which have even available today, Path of the Masters and some other books that he wrote. And Julian Johnson, when he first came, uh, it's an interesting story. He was a minister, a priest, working in India to convert the poor people of Calcutta region into Christianity. That was his job. He went to India for that purpose. And he was working in Calcutta and but some disciple of great master, two disciples, Mr. and Mrs. Brock, who were in the United States at that time, they wrote to him, you are very lucky you are in India. Don't miss the chance of meeting a great master who lives on the bank of the river Vyas in India. So Julian Johnson said, I will certainly like to see that man because my friends have told me he's a very enlightened person. So I like to go and see him. So he wrote to the great master from Calcutta. He had never met him, just heard about him. So he wrote to the master, Master, I am Julian Johnson, a doctor from United States, and I have come uh, from uh, Calcutta. I have come to Calcutta to do my missionary work here. But my friends have told me, who are your disciples, that I should see you. When can I come and see you? And how can I reach you? So, Master asked his uh, attorney, one of his attorneys, Bhagat Singh, that you live near the railroad station uh, in, of Jalandhar city, which is 20 miles away from the Dera of Bias. And there is another city, Amritsar, which is further away, but it's also about 25 miles away. It will be better if he comes to Jalandhar city near your house. You can go and pick him up and bring him, write to him that he can come on his date and uh, you'll pick him up on the, on the railroad station. So Bhagat Singh wrote Julian Johnson that you can certainly come to see the great master. And I live very close to this railroad station and I'll be at the platform waiting for you. There are not many foreigners coming on the platform these days. I recognize you as an American. And so when you land, I will take you to see the master. So Julian Johnson arrives and Bhagat Singh 
recognizes him, says, I am Bhagat Singh, an attorney working as a secretary to the master. They have come to receive you, take you to the master. Now, what did the master do in the meanwhile? He said to Bhagat Singh, let's play a little trick with him. Which is surprising for some people when they hear the story, masters play tricks also. Of course they do. They are very clever people. They, they are human beings with a lot of sense of humor. They are human beings just like us. And they, are, they have all the playfulness. In fact, our understanding is that the creator is very playful. And we use the word moj to say it is his moj that everything is happening. And moj is being mistranslated as will. Moj is not will. When people say let's have fun, they say let's have moj. So it is playful will. So masters also have that playful will. In the, and you can see great master had that. He never met this man before. And he says, Bhagat Singh, let's play a little trick. Trick will be, I will go and hide in your house in Jalandhar. When Julian Johnson comes, he will be very anxious to see me. And he will say, let's go to see the master. And you tell him, no, you come after a long journey, let's go home and have a cup of tea. And he will get irritated and angry with you. But you bring him home. And then you say, I have a surprise for you, Julian Johnson. He is the master. So I'll wait inside your house and give him a surprise. This was arranged, pre-arranged. And it happened exactly like that. Julia Johnson landed at the platform of the railroad station. And Bhagat Singh says, you come after a long journey and let's go home. I'm just a few minutes away from here. We'll have a cup of tea and then I'll drive you to the Dera to see the master. And he said, no, I've not come for tea. I've not come here for tea. I've come to see this master. Let's go straight there. No, what's the hurry? We can just spend some time. So Julia Johnson got angry. He said, no, but I haven't come for that. I don't have time for that. I want to see the master. No, no, there's no hurry. To, he drove him to his house. And he was angry. Julia Johnson, why is he wasting my time? This attorney doesn't understand what I've come here for. When they went inside, he said, I have a surprise for you, Dr. Julia Johnson. And he took him to the living room. Great master was sitting there. Now, Julia Johnson writes a letter to his friends in America on the same evening. He says to see the great master was such a surprise for me. And I couldn't believe. Is he human? Or is he God in flesh? I sat, I couldn't speak. I was looking at him. And I said, Master, you came all the way to see me here? And he said, simple words, but Julian Johnson, you came thousands of miles to see me. I just came 20 miles. And looking at him and his smile affected me so much. And he wrote to his friends the same night, if I get nothing more than what I've got today, I fulfilled my mission and I got what I wanted. That was the impact on that. I, I, maybe the same impact would have been there if he had met the master in that era. But by putting, creating a surprise for that, it added to the value of his seating, the master. So masters can do many things. We sometimes don't understand why they are doing it. Now this Julian Johnson, I was a young boy at that time in that era, and I could speak English. I was going to schools where I could speak English. Most children could not do that. So I became his friend, and he would share a lot of information with me. We would go together for morning walks to the river, the river Bias. On the way, we would talk. And he would tell about his stories about America, about what is going on there, and how he came, and how he was working in Calcutta. And this goes on for quite a while. And every time I was in the Dera, and we would, I, he, a very nice man, we would discuss his spiritual ideas. He meditated a lot. Once he was initiated, he meditated a lot. So much so, he didn't want any distraction. So he found that there were some sadhus who were living in the Dera and they were meditating in little caves on the river bluff. The river bluff, they dug up some caves so that nobody disturbed them. Julian Johnson dug up his own cave. And he made it a little better. 
and if little furnished, little rubbed it there and a little wooden door also in place so he could lock the cave. It was his meditation chamber. So it's a beautiful place. I also meditated in that cave for some time. So I remember we used to walk up to the river and he used to go to great master. Master, my friend in America is having a lot of trouble and there's a problem with his wife's problem with this thing. Can you do some divine intervention? The great master would say, okay, I'll talk to my master and see if he can help. After a couple of years, two, three years, I was walking with him and he said, do you know what a mistake I've been making? I've been telling master to intervene in the karma of these people. And now I realize karma is not a bad thing. Good and bad karma, both are good. Because that is what the balance is, which is creating our human life. And I don't think I'm doing the right thing. We have been given on a platter, a karma in which we can meet the master. And I'm trying to interfere with that. That's not good. These words have not left me till today. Because we always evaluated karma as good and bad. And said, no, you should have good karma, you got bad karma, poor fellow, bad karma. We didn't realize that both of them are necessary to create a condition to give us a human body in the only way in which we can find a perfect living master and go to our true home. It's a, it's a blessing. This was a very big eye-opening thing for me that we are intervening in karma. No, unless it's so heavy that one cannot even continue to follow the path. That's different. Divine intervention is good when your karma is so heavy, it interferes even with your meditating, it interferes even with your remembering your master, it's worthwhile getting intervention. And divine intervention does come at that time. Divine intervention can come to such an extent, masters as physical human beings take upon the illness upon themselves. And their illness is much less than the illness or the obstacles that are coming in the way of the disciples. When there is a real problem, they come and intervene. But for every day to say, my karma should be all good and I should have no bad karma, was not the proper way of looking at it. I learned this lesson from Julian Johnson. And he learned it after three, four years of experience with great master. That what am I telling him? I can tell you many stories of Julian Johnson and he had such a great impact on people, impact on me also. And he was a great disciple, a great master. There's so many other stories I could keep on telling you of those days. The point I'm making is that masters, when they pick us up and they say, you are accepted, initiated, they take full responsibility of the disciple. They take responsibility, this soul, will go back to the true home. No question. No doubt. The rest is all going through the rest of our karma here. As I said, karma is of three kinds. The one, destiny, we come with. The destiny, we are born with. In, in Indian language, they call it pralabdha karma. Pralabdha means it is predestined. It is made before you were born. The whole of pralab is made before even the conception, even before you are conceived. You are living in another body, walking about, and you are going to die and be born somewhere. The other new mother has already conceived you and you are, your karma is all there at the time of conception. The fetus will grow, the embryo will grow according to that karma. And therefore, it's all predetermined in advance. The destiny is predetermined. Where you will be born, where you will die, what accidents will happen, all written up in advance. Almost, in most cases, 80-85% of our life comes pre-written like this, leaving some gaps in between where we get choices, a choice to make. Pralabdha karma is at 85% which is already given to us, predetermined. When we have a choice, 
that is also been determined at another level but not at this level at this level we feel now we have to decide we don't decide where we are born we don't decide when an accident happens those are all decided by breed our destiny but in between the destiny they are says should i take this job or not should i marry this woman or not should i follow this or not should i go this way or that way those opportunities that come create the new karma it's called karman karma it is creating a new destiny for us karman karma is the new karma what the difference between prarabdha karma the destiny and new karma that we creating for the future the new karma always requires a deliberation in the mind use of free will and choice and when we deliberate should i do this or that in the mind and then decide new karma if it just happens without our deliberation old karma being paid off a lot of people have confusion that how to distinguish between the two distinction is very simple you have to think and decide before a new karma can be created then karma is created not by action but by intention all karma is carried on the mind no way else not on the body the body is being made according to the karma in the mind the body designed right from inception conception designed according to the karma and therefore is all built up according to karma held in the mind karma is a long standing thing because the mind has a long life much longer life than the astral body or the physical body in physical terms they count it as millions of years so that is why the same mind continues with the same soul same mind continues having so many incarnations so the second part of karma karman karma is created by intention to act when you intend to do something and you deliberate and say i want to do this you create a karma right there if you implement it the karma is enhanced and the effect is enhanced intention has a certain level of reaction and to carry it out is a certain other level of reaction a bigger level reaction it can be both good karma reward <clears throat> bad karma and our conscience which is part of the mind determines and tells us this is right this is wrong which is built up because of our way we are brought up way we are born way we are brought up in society all those outside environments appear to be building up that the ultimate truth is different the ultimate truth says that you creating the society it builds up like that so it both ways but since we sitting here don't know we create the universe the we have been placed in the universe as human beings so we feel that our upbringing our parents our religion all those have created our ethical notions what is good what is bad whatever it is is stored in a part of the mind called conscience not conscious conscience and that tells us all the time this is wrong don't do it but we do it anyway and then we regret then we have a guilt about it and that creates a negative reaction in karma we create so much karma in one lifetime because of the karma we created by intention if it is only action would be very little because we have intention to do things and we don't do it the karma is still being created therefore lot of it is created which can never be accommodated in one more life that is why the spill over of extra karma goes into a reserve also held in the mind that is reserved karma we call it sinchit karma and sinchit karma has grown so much in our lives that even if we had no karma created in one life the sinchit is enough to create more lives for us so it's a very big trap it's a trap that can never let us go out of it there is no way anybody can get out of here by good actions you can get rewarded again and again rewards can come in the same system rewards can come in heavens rewards can come in the astral cosmic planes and the punishments can come also there in the astral planes so but you don't get out of the system it's a very tight kind of system and a very big prison i do not know any prison that can hold us so tight as this one there is no way to get out of it and the mind that has been given to us thinks is the final entity i the thinking i is the self is the soul 
so many people when i came to united states first time they were talking to some faculty members in the university in harvard university where i was studying and they were talking you know the ancient concepts or these indian concepts of uh, self or uh, mind or soul or whatever they call it as if there was no difference between mind and soul that's how they were talking they were just thinking oh you mean a higher mind or lower mind or they wouldn't go beyond it so i realized there's no knowledge at all the living force is totally independent of the mind mind is a thinking machine it's an accessory to the soul consciousness or life is different from the thinking machine mind can't do anything except thinking rationalizing using its own functions in a limited time space soul doesn't need that the distinction was not known and that is why so many people were just confined to that and that they don't get out of the trap there is no way to get out of this trap of the mind trap of being within the three regions of physical astral causal without some help intervention from outside people ask me simple question you say god is within us we are seekers of that god why do we need an agent to take us there we don't need a master god is inside we can find god inside sure you can how will you find god inside with your mind the question is being asked by the mind the answer is being given by the mind and the mind will say there is god not only that people have realized that god is at different levels that who they thought was the creative power exists at every level the same creative power as they call god the ultimate creator whatever level you have achieved you think that is the ultimate and therefore that's what is god for you that is why this trap is very heavy trap very i can't see how one can get out of it except must be very lucky day when our seeking says i want to go beyond my mind i want to go to my true home beyond the mind not this thinking mind not the mind that giving all the trouble to me when those thoughts come very lucky day and that's when the perfect living master appears in our life and with his love with his love he pulls us right from here he starts we start feeling it when we have had no experience inner or outer the love experience is the first one and then that pull comes and as we advance further the pull comes inside and outside both and when we can manifest the form of the master inside when we see the radiant form of the master our journey is over on the spiritual path a perfect living master takes full responsibility 100% responsibility to take the soul back to its true form it's not a partial thing it's not a guide okay i tell you the way now you go not like that at all and you do not travel alone when you are initiated by a perfect living master you travel with the master the only part of the journey when you appear to be alone actually you are not alone even then but you appear to be alone is from here the third eye center and concentrating your attention there i get a lot of uh, emails i want the radiant form of the master asap <laughs> i want it right now well the radiant form is with you just go and see it it's not going to come it's there if you have been initiated by a perfect living master it's there so sometimes they say we see master inside in meditation but we haven't seen the radiant form in what form have you seen there why do we call it radiant form people are sometimes thinking maybe light is coming out of that master or something that's not true the radiant form only means that you can see the master in utter darkness why we call it radiant form because you are also radiant there you close your eyes completely dark cover them with all things sit in a dark room you can still see and when you can see the master in meditation that's the radiant form people don't understand a great definition is being made of a radiant form when you are able to see the master inside okay if if there's a some tips i can give you 
to see the radiant forms. It's so many of you are writing to me ASAP. I tell you the ASAP method. The ASAP method is that you remember the master. Not picture. Not look at a picture. Not make up the image. Remember how you actually met him. This is a memory. Remember how you actually met him. And when you remember that, naturally, the actual picture of the master will come as you actually saw him in physical life. It's not being made up by the mind. It's a memory, it's a call of having seen the master. When you remember that, you start talking to that master. Now, what happened in the memory was up to a certain point, the master did not go beyond after that you left the physical experience. But inside, master will continue to talk beyond that. And that will manifest the radiant form ASAP. So I'm giving you a little tip. But this has to be done. Actually, it is a requirement. When the Surta Shabda Yoga method is given to us through initiation and through the method of meditation, there are three things in meditation. It's a simple process. First, repetition of words, Simran, Mantra, whatever you like to call it. And people don't know why they are doing it. They think the mantra is carrying very big power and is going to give us something. You can keep on repeating like a parrot all your life. Nothing happens. Spoken words are not giving anything. Then what is the purpose of repeating all words? Words which have not much reference to outside events, but they look repeatable. They are uh, easy to repeat, but they have no but sensed for us at this time, those words are repeated so that the mind that is thinking in words has to start repeating those words and it can think less. It's just a way of throwing the thinking words outside and pumping in the words of meditation, of similar. That's one main purpose, the mechanical purpose. Mechanical purpose of making the mind think less of other things and think more of the words you are repeating. That's a mechanical purpose and a very good one. But the second more important purpose is to listen to the words which you are repeating with the mind that are drawing your attention inside. The whole object of meditation is to draw your attention inside to the third eye center. And you are repeating those words with the mind at the third eye center. That is why when you listen to those words, you are performing a second function. And there's a third function, which is created by a master using words and empowering them with a positive energy so that the negative energy cannot come near it. So you can use those words to prevent negativity from coming near you. Three purposes of the repetition. They are all good, all worthwhile. But the ultimate aim is merely use words till you reach a sound that you can hear inside. Words are no longer necessary after that. Your listening capacity should increase and you should listen more. And when you reach those points, this is first what is called Simran, a repetition of words. Just for these three purposes. Second part is listening. The soul listens. In our consciousness, it's built like that. The soul listens, the mind speaks. All thoughts that are spoken in the head are spoken by the mind. Soul doesn't speak, but soul listens. The capacity to see is called nirat. The capacity to hear, to see, hear, listen is called surat. Nirat and surat go together and they can go even beyond in a non-physical, non-astral, non-causal way. So that is why some experiences have been described which can be heard or seen but not spoken. So the speaking is ending very quickly in our spiritual growth. So that is why the speaking is used only in the beginning. So when we use speaking as the repetition of words, first phase. When we listen to the music, first starting with the listening to the word, then listening to the inner music, the second part. Third part is dhyan, contemplation of the face of your master, which helps you to develop your love and devotion. So dhyan is equally important. In fact, According to me, it's more important if you are asking for radiant form ASAP. Then dhyan is number one. That if you, now dhyan should be done 
not by figuring out a picture of a master, not by figuring out some holy figure, not looking at a picture to do it, but remembering the actual meeting with your master who initiated you. So if you can remember when you met him, it's just a memory. When the memory recalls that image in front of you, then it then you start talking and even if it disappears, it reappears again. It all depends on how much attention you can pull at that time within yourself to third eye center and you can have the experience of the radiant form of a master. So it's not that hard. People think it's so hard to get it. It can be obtained by proper dhyan. And dhyan is contemplation of the face of the master. Now there's one good thing. When a perfect living master initiates us, the mind cannot make up his face. That's a very good, very good thing to know. That the eyes and the forehead of a perfect living master cannot be made up by the mind, even by imagination. No matter how hard it tries. So when you see an image and you are not sure, is it my mind is just making up an image or is it real? And you repeat those words, they will be empowered to cut off the face. And you will not be able to see the eyes and the forehead of a master at all. If you can see, it is the master. So there are a lot of safeguards provided to us so we are not misled by the mind and thinking that we are meditating in the right way. So that is why it is important to use these devices given to us that we can be sure that when we are seeing the eyes and the forehead and face of a master, it is the master. That is the radiant form. That is the form that you can talk to. <clears throat> and when that stabilizes, it will take you together. It will be a friend as good as a friend outside. That master, when you stabilize, it takes time. I must say, it takes a little while because our attention does not stay steady inside in the beginning. Over pra in practice, you can get this done. So with practice, when you can manifest the face of your master like this, he will stay with you all the time. He'll become like a friend. He's a friend, a real friend. You travel together. You go to higher levels together, floor spaces together, your curiosity can be fulfilled together. Use common sense in understanding these are not impossible things. Only we should know how to do it. If we know how to do it and get guidance. You have questions, you must ask. If you haven't manifested the master inside, ask outside. We didn't have that facility in our time of emails and uh, uh, digital systems working. It took a long time to get answers to our questions. We had to go wait for some time. But now, nowadays, it's much easier. As the distractions increase, the facilities are also increasing. There are more distractions today to getting back to the third eye center. The attention is drawn more to distractions outside, but there are more facilities available to get help also. So that is why use all the facilities you can. I'm very happy to share all these things with you from my experiences and I hope they will be of, of some use to you. I know you are traveling the same path I am traveling. We are co-travelers. As co-travelers, somebody may be a little ahead, some may be a little behind, but we can help each other. So I am just sitting here sharing these things with you as four travelers sitting on the spiritual path and I hope some of these things I am sharing because of my age and long association with the great master they will be helpful to you. So thank you very much for your very patient listening and I will see you briefly in the afternoon at 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock today.